Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking like a fan. You know, I feel as familiar with this group as I felt in 1981. It's funny how 20 years isn't really that long of a time. I hadn't been in the movie business very long, so it's not as though I had a huge track record of reading a lot of screenplays, but I have to say that it was clearly an incredibly special story, and now that I look back 20 years and I have read hundreds, thousands of screenplays, I recognize just how rare it was. And it was an excellent first draft and something we made very few changes to. So at the time, a great story and in perspective, um, pretty incredible. What is it? You won't hurt you, Gertie. I think we did a screen test just to see how E.T. would look on film. And that was the first time I actually saw him. And I really had no idea what to expect. The eyes were very kind, you know, and, and very real. And I think that was the whole secret behind people actually attaching any kind of sentimental value to E.T. himself, was it was all in the eyes. Do you like working with E.T.? Yeah, it's fun. What does he do? Okay, stand by for picture. He can move his head up and down. We were talking this morning about how much I used to communicate with E.T. and talk with him and uh, spend a lot of time with him and how much I cared about him and I felt he cared about us and you know I knew on an intelligent level not that I was intelligent but I knew on a brain level that he wasn't real but I believe that everyone that made him come to life was sort of a part of what made him real and that and that he was like a guardian angel and watching over us and and there to teach us deep meaning about people and a way of life and I just embraced him so much and you know I know that sounds a little crazy but <laughs> I he was you know one of the first most important friends of my life how you feeling faker I'm feeling fine look I've got something really you know, important to tell you. Got I spent a lot more time with Henry rather than Drew we, Drew was with us but I felt really protective of Henry because all, all of our scenes were together and we had a lot of scenes that were just the two of us I remember the first time I saw E.T., though, was uh, when I see him in the movie for the first time, because I kept pumping Henry for information, because he'd already <laughs> had these scenes with him. So I was asking him, what does it look like? What, you know, what is it like? And he was keeping secret about it, and then, then that's the scene when all the shelves come down. Elliot, look what I did for Also, I did not know the shelves were coming down either, which was added to the shock value. It was, it was great because it just happened and, and sir, it enhanced my whole reaction. Hey, Andy, how do you feel? What happened in here? I was very comfortable. Oh. <laughs> I was. I, I actually prefer working the same way they did, just being in the moment. And he'd throw me lines and they'd throw me lines I didn't know were coming. And, I prefer working that way, so I was very comfortable and at home with all of them. And I felt, the first time I saw E.T., I didn't think of it. it even sitting here, you said to Henry, well, how did you feel the first time you saw the puppet? And I kind of went like that because I, I truly never thought of E.T. as a puppet. He was very real to all of us. You really have to understand that he, he was. And um, I felt like the mom who is one of the kids. <laughs> um, Peter, I think what you should do is this. When, when you bring Elliot over and you, and you come around here to this side. I had lived on communes for a dozen years before coming to this set. And this set felt just exactly like the communes to me. There were lots of kids running around. Everybody was friendly. Everyone knew each other. Everybody was working. So it kind of, I said earlier, that it spoiled you a little bit. Maybe we were thinking of E.T. as a children's movie to some degree. And so it was very pleasant to play an adult who wasn't cast as two-dimensional or unkind or someone who misunderstood children. And I really appreciated the permission that Stephen gave to this character to be compassionate and sensitive and say in effect subliminally, you know, it doesn't all die when you grow up. I've been wishing for this since I was 10 years old. You can still keep the best part of being a child when you grow up. I'm still proud of that today, and I still feel it when I see the movie. Would you like the flowers? <laughs> God, 
Nice. That worked nice. That worked nice. That worked nice. That worked nice. Do it one more time like that to be sure. That was wonderful. Print that one. I think movies in general often, just by their very nature, form a kind of family environment, some more dysfunctional than others. This happened to function very well. But I would say that that was definitely the case. I also think when young children are very much an important part of making a movie, it does create a whole sensitivity on a set that just makes it, by its very nature of having kids around, a very, very pleasant place to be. Help! Help! <laughs> oh, God! What? E.T. was dressed up as sort of an old lady, and I kind of dressed up in the E.T. costume. I dressed up in this kind of uh, bag lady's wardrobe. Here comes my grandma. Hello, Ducky. What a minute. I directed the day, took the heels off, and went back to the tennis shoes. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun. You know, I, I feel like this was my first family. This is the first time I ever really experienced what, what it was like to really be a father. And I think, in a sense, that carried over after the movie with Drew, who I spent more time with, I guess, than any of the other cast members. We. We had a life after the movie, actually, together, and spent a lot of time together. And uh, she was part of my family for a long time. So, you know, Henry and, and Robert and Drew introduced me to fatherhood, and I think, bless their hearts, made me ready to be a father in real life. Is that for me? Thank you. Oh, it's homemade, I can tell. Thank you. But my pal, right, pal? The scenes where E.T. dies, those had a lot more meaning to us because they were shot late in the film. I know I cried because partly I, I had watched Dee's and, and Drew's scene of watching them cry and, and the whole atmosphere around the set was somber. It really hit home. We had had time to build an emotional relationship with E.T. by shooting it that way. So we were really being affected as if it were another character that we had worked with for a long time and become emotionally involved with. And you're in this house that feels so safe mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there are, you know, plastic and tubes and doctors and machines and it becomes so opposite, the antithesis of this warm, safe place that you had known. Everything changes, you know. It's, it does, it changes everything. See, now when you said that, I, I could really flash back into what that experience must have been like for you at six. Yeah. Because I was thinking, I was feeling really protective toward you especially. Like in the scene with the train, with, when the guy's putting his hand through the window and... Yeah, what must what it be being, like for these children, you know, to have their environment invaded like this? But thinking from a mother's point of view, you know. You can't get a pulse of blood pressure on the creature. It doesn't look like he's breathing. You can't breathe. Well, in the world of unintended consequences, I always thought from that scene where we had the real doctors that that's where all of those ER and Chicago Hope and St. <laughs> Elsewhere came from because I'd never seen real medicine on screen before and we had real doctors and they were saying we real were the dialogue. Beginning. Right, I think so. Well, I wanted, I wanted to hire real doctors because it's hard to believe actors who have to, through rote memorization, learn all these terms and then spit it out as if they've known these terms ever yeah. since medical school. It's very hard to, to achieve that reality. And so I got my doctor, my internist, to get a bunch of his friends who were all surgeons at USC Medical Center to come down and be in the movie. And I bet it was tough it, too, it was, huh, uh, Oh, they came, they, they, <laughs> it was tough t saying no to the doctors who wanted to be in the movie. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been too much. We would have had to have medevac people coming in the room. That part was really scary. It was scary for me to hear the overlapping dialogue, which you don't often hear in movies, and, and, and to see the equipment and Drew's reaction when the paddles came in, they tried to jumpstart E.T.'s heart, and she leapt off the ground. Stand clear. <laughs> And when she heard that explosion of electricity going into E.T., Drew just lost it. She lost it. And I don't know what you were, do you remember what you were feeling? I, I had never seen a machine like that. I didn't know that this existed. And I just kept thinking about the heart. I always talk about the big red beating heart and to see something like hurting that. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like the greatest violation and like all your dreams crashing away and you know, your safety and your security. And, and in a lot of ways, we were taught love mm -hmm. through that experience, how to love and how to take care of and be kind and be open and 
what that big red beating heart was all about, you know. So that was a complete violation to me when I saw someone, I thought, hurting it, but I now, I now know they were trying to help him. Trying to save him, yeah. But I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know what that machine was. He's a man from outer space, and they're taking him to a spaceship. I remember having the thought then that the 80s was a turbulent time also, and that I always thought that one of the things that made people love this film was if two people or three people as far apart as E.T. and those children could bridge a gap and fall in love with one another and communicate, then there, was, there were no two people on Earth that were that far apart. And it just seems prescient to me that in a time like today that's fraught with cultural misunderstandings and danger and enmity and hatred, that this message is being replayed and that it happens before your eyes. It's not pretended. The feelings of these child actors were not pretended. They were palpably real. That's why they moved people. And I think it's a great thing to remember that if E.T. and these humans can make an understanding, there's nothing preventing any two people or two nations on Earth from doing it. And that's pretty much, I think, what happened in the year of 1982, when the world kind of came together for E.T. and all the lines between cultures and class systems and, and racial barriers, you know, came down in a kind of shared experience. He is the cutest alien I have ever met and seen. I want to know about the other aliens you met before E.T. in that yeah, case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't seen it in 12 years, and so I watched it um, from a bit of a different perspective than I had ever been able to. And on an emotional level, it still has the same impact and deeper now than ever now that I value the amazing ability to feel. All the messages in it are so profound and beautiful, and it's such an extraordinary, perfect movie and a very perfect experience. I was just so happy and I cried and I brought my tissue in and it was a very profound, perfect experience. And I'm, you know, I'm just grateful to be a part of it. I'm keeping him. The best moment of all was seeing it for the first time in a theater with an audience and feeling the overwhelming emotion that was pouring out of this audience and watching the film. It was really one of the most amazing moments in my life. I mean, you could feel it. Everybody related to the film. Everybody needed that somehow, you know? And it was, it was truly an amazing, amazing experience. I'd seen a sneak preview somewhere before the release date, and then I went back to my home and I felt like I had this great secret, you know? Because it was secret. We weren't allowed to talk about it all that much. But I remember riding my bike around my, my uh, hometown and humming the theme in my head and just being like, yeah, <laughs> you know? Uh, that's I can't wait for this to hit. That's, that's, that's great. I was so terrified every day of making the movie because it was the first movie that I had that level of responsibility that it's really been in looking back that it's defined something very special and unique because I think what it continually defines for me is the importance of doing the things that you just feel are good stories and that you feel have a place in some way in your own life. And then you hope that that is communicated to an audience. I think that we get caught in the trap of trying to tell stories sometimes that you think may appeal to an audience. And I think you have to start with yourself. And so I think that's what E.T. defined for me. I think the thing that was so stunning was the synchronicity between this movie and its audience. Something was coming through the earth, and Stephen and Kathy were able to grab it and articulate it, and we were all able to make this thing, and it resonated with millions and millions and millions of people. They were feeling it before the film was made. They were waiting for something to give them mouths and to give them articulation. People have sent posters to me from Indonesia and videotapes of me speaking Tagalog in <laughs> E.T. And that's as close to a universal phenomenon as I've ever approached. And I hope I'm lucky enough to ride such a grand wave again in my life.
remember that moment well. <laughs> um, it was a quick moment. It was a real moment. My heart was full, and that describes, I think, the most of what I took away from ET is that we're all responsible for defining who we are and getting back to our own home, whatever that home is, for growing and deciding who we want to be, and in that growth, touching other people along the way. We all want to see peace on earth and goodwill to each other, and you know, and we wish for it, and we pray for it, and. We work our magic as parents on our own children to try to achieve that, and we do what we can to teach about tolerance and against intolerance, and we do all we can, and just not enough people are doing all they can about it, unfortunately. Just a rehearsal. I knew from the first day of shooting that the film was really special, and I knew that it was certainly going to be a winner in my heart for the rest of my life. I didn't know how the rest of the world would react. Quite frankly, it's, it's nice to hope for the best, but I didn't dare allow myself to dream and wish about that part of the movie-making process. I was just trying to be so proud of the movie. It was not hard to be proud of the movie. Every single day, discoveries were being made, and the film was cutting together so effortlessly that I just knew that if nobody saw this picture except moms with kids, it didn't matter because if it served, serviced that audience, fantastic. It was the crossover into people in their 80s and 90s that was so amazing to me and also in every country had the same reaction. But I thought the film was certainly going to be a personal winner. It was fun. You know, I, I feel like this was my first family. So uh, it's just a beautiful time to all be getting back together again.